Good morning, family, and welcome to Woodland Church. I'm so delighted you're here today, and I'm so thankful that we've been able to just lift our hands and worship and praise. We've been able to receive the Lord's Supper together and worship Him, and I hope you've also joined in, as Pastor Corey asked you to do earlier in the service, and that was give unto the Lord. Let's worship the Lord with our giving, and if you haven't done so yet, let me just encourage you to trust the Lord. I know God's people want to be faithful with their tithes and offerings. I know God's people want to give. And you say, Pastor, how do you know that? Because the Spirit of the Lord lives in our hearts. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, there's freedom, there's peace. And and there's also that desire to give. But sometimes people can be afraid. And maybe you're afraid that if you give, you won't have enough left over. But I promise you this. If you put God first in your finances, He's going to meet your needs and supply them in ways that will be beyond your wildest imagination because faithful is he who has called us. And Jesus just promises that those who give, it will be given back to them. And I love those descriptors, pressed down, shaken together, and running over without measure. That's how God will give into your life as you give. So you can text 77977 with the keyword Woodland Church. Just think of Woodland Church as being one word. Or you can go right online and go to woodland.church, click the button that says give, or you can give this morning and leave your gifts with one of our ushers on your way out of the building. And may God bless you so much for your faithfulness and giving. I'm going to pray over you in just a second uh, for your giving as I pray for the message as well. But I have a big, big announcement. For some of you, this is going to be a surprise. For some of you, it's not going to be a surprise. But Pastor Rick and Norma Sutherland are moving to Texas. Of all places, they're moving to Texas. They want to be close to their grandchildren. And so Sunday, May 2nd, we're going to be honoring them here at the church. It's going to be Pastor Rick and Norma Sutherland Day. He and I are going to be co-preaching together. We want to put together a pictorial collage of thanks from you. So what I'd like you to do is write your expressions of love to Pastor Rick and Norma. You can send those to us as a text message. You can send them to us as an email. And also some pictures you have that would be memorable that you would love to share with them. And we're going to put it all together, give it to them to take with them so that they remember us. I know they'll never forget us, but, you know, sometimes I like to go back and look at my photos, especially of my grandchildren, and just remind myself of all those happy memories. They have been a part of this community of faith for 33 years. And for 20 of those years, Pastor Rick has been on staff, and you have been the beneficiaries of the wisdom, the godly counsel that have come through Pastor Rick and Norma. So join us on Sunday, May 2nd. Put it on your calendar. Now, you also want to set aside some cash because we want to give them a special gift. We want to give them a big gift as we send them away and just say thank you so much for how you served. And of course, Pastor Rick and Norma have promised me. Now, I emphasize that word promise, Pastor Rick. They have promised me they're going to be coming back to visit with us, especially during the summer when it gets so hot in Texas. They'll want to come back to the godly summers that we have in Michigan. So right now, let's prepare our hearts. We're going to go to the word of the Lord this morning. I was reading the script of a play. I've not actually seen the play, but I was reading the script of a play because it was recommended to me called The Black Angel. It's by a uh, writer by the name of Michael Christopher. And The Black Angel is the story of a German general who was responsible for the death of over 300 Jewish people during the Holocaust. At the Nuremberg trials, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison, not to death, but to 20 years in prison. There was a French reporter by the name of Moreau that was just incensed, and so he swore to himself that when Ingalls was released from prison, that if, if the Nuremberg jury didn't have the courage to put him to death, then he would see to it that he died. And so when Ingalls got out of prison, he moved to a small village in the mountains of France, and he built a small cabin for he and his wife to live out the years that they had left to them. Moreau went there with vengeance in his heart. He stirred up all of the people there in this tiny little village, and they decided they were going to burn down the house of the general and kill him and his wife. 
Well, the reporter in Moreau, the more he thought about it, he thought, I've got to go interview Ingalls. So he went up the night before to interview Ingalls and to ask him about the things he had done. He didn't tell him everything that was going on. And so when he got to Ingalls, Ingalls explained to him, and that's important, he explained to him why he did what he did, why, what it was like to be a German officer in Hitler's demonic war machine in Nazi Germany. When he got done explaining what he had, had done to the reporter, Moreau had a change of heart. He realized what was going to happen, and he said to the general, he says, you've got to flee. You've got to get out of town. Here's what's going to happen. There's a mob forming in the village. Tomorrow night, their plans are to kill you and to kill your wife and to burn down your home. And he says, if you'll come with me, I'll get you out of town. I'll get you out of the country so that you'll be safe. And Ingalls looked at him and he said, if you will forgive me, I will go with you. And Moreau's eyes flashed with anger, according to the writer. And he says, I will save your life but I will never forgive you for what you've done. And you know, that really bears and brings home the truth that I want to, to bring to you this morning. It bears the truth in that there are some things we can never forget, but it brings home the truth that we all need forgiveness and we all need to learn how to forgive. So I'm going to ask you if you would, stand with me this morning as we go to the Scriptures, and I want to read you the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus wrote these words, or said these words, Pray like this, Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon, and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us to today the food we need, and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sinned against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive those, now Jesus follows up the prayer. He says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Our Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the forgiveness and the grace that you have given to us in Christ Jesus. And now, Lord, as we come to this precious portion of Scripture that brings us comfort as we pray it daily, that brings us strength, Lord, as we live it out, God, that empowers us to overcome the wicked one, I ask you now, in the name of Jesus, set these words aflame in our hearts and strengthen us, O Lord, with the knowledge that we have been forgiven of our sins and empower us with the strength that comes to forgive others of their sins. For it's in your holy name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, God bless you. You can be seated this morning. You know, when I read these words of Jesus... There's something that stands out to me, kind of in boxcar size letters, and I'd like you to get that. And that is, when I forgive, it's a sign that I've been forgiven. When I forgive, it's a sign that I've been forgiven. You may want to write that down to the side of your outline or in your app if you're taking notes on the app this morning. You see, people who can forgive are people that have been forgiven. And sometimes I think we misunderstand what this whole concept of forgiveness is. And maybe that's why we struggle with it. Forgiveness doesn't minimize the sin that has been done against us. It doesn't minimize the offense. In other words, we don't justify what someone has done to us. And forgiveness doesn't mean that instantaneously the relationship is restored to what it once used to be. Some sins are so grievous that it takes time to rebuild trust and to rebuild confidence and rebuild the relationship to where it once was. But this is the painful part. Forgiveness starts where you're at, not where you wish you were at. Sometimes the sins that are done against us are so painful and so grievous that you have to recognize you're at a new place in life. You're at a new position in life. It's not where you want to be. It's not where you wish to be. None of us want to be in a COVID type of situation that we're in. The whole world wishes that COVID was done away with. Someone said to me yesterday, they said, you know, I know that COVID is not going away anytime soon until we reach herd immunity. So in the meantime, we have to learn how to live and how to cope with COVID. 
And I think forgiveness is the same way. Forgiveness starts where where we're at after the offense has been committed, not where we want to be. But I think there's one other thing that I would say to you, and that is forgiveness doesn't guarantee us a painless future. For those of you who've lost a loved one, for those of you who've lost someone close to you, and just think of how many people that we have lost in Michigan who have died due to COVID. For those families, life will never be the same again at holidays or at Christmas time, especially when they were not able to be with their loved ones when they died. It's going to leave a mark. It's going to leave a scar on the soul of our nation, on the soul of the world. And sometimes sins leave scars upon us. We can forgive and we can move on, but we don't necessarily forget. You see, there is a real difference between remembering someone's sins against them and forgetting. The Bible tells us that God doesn't remember our sins against us. We've looked at that in the past two weeks. In other words, it's not that God forgets. God can't forget. He knows everything. He knows the past, the present, and the future. But he doesn't remember against us our sins. In other words, he doesn't hold our sins against us. And you and I, we have the power to not remember someone's sins against them, but we don't have the power to forget those sins. And that's very important to distinguish this morning, beloved. You see, we have the power to say, I'm not going to hold this against you. I'm not going to bear a grudge against you. I'm not going to remember this sin against you. But we don't have the power to forget what's happened. Those of you that have scars on your body, you know that a certain scar can be touched and it brings a painful sensation. Maybe you lie in the bed at night and you turn over and you feel that scar. You feel the pain of that sensation and you immediately roll back into the position that you were. There are some memories that are like that, that we, we don't forget. And sometimes it's a, it's a fragrance, it's a city, it's a restaurant, it's a song. It brings it back to us. But we choose as passionate followers of Christ to never remember the sin against the person who caused us the pain. You see, according to what we just read in the scripture, we're responsible for how we respond to offenses. I'm responsible for how I respond to those who sin against me. I can't control what they're going to do. I can't control their sins. And so therefore, I'm responsible to how I respond to them. I would like to think that I'm never going to sin against anybody, but I know better than that. My past has told me that. My history tells me that. But I want people to forgive me just like Ingalls wanted to be forgiven. And so it's important that I understand that though I can't control what somebody else does or has done or will do, I can control my response to their sin. Let's look again at the words of Jesus in Matthew 6 and verse 12. Forgive us for our sins just as we have forgiven those who've sinned against us. Jesus assumes that you're going to forgive. You've been forgiven of a great debt. I've been forgiven of a great debt. We looked at the story that Becky Pippert told last week of how the greatest sin that we've ever committed was when we were guilty of crucifying Christ. Martin Luther says, we carry the nails of his crucifixion in our pockets. And so we understand that we've been given, forgiven of a greater debt than anybody could ever sin against us. And so we, in response to our own forgiveness, it's a sign that I've been forgiven, that we forgive. In response to our forgiveness, we forgive those who sin against us. But you see, there is a thing that happens in our life, and it happens to all human beings, and Ingalls was doing that. You see, confession of sin is different than explaining our sin. You know, you can explain your sin like Ingalls did to Moreau. He explained his sins. But confession is much more than than explaining our sins. But also, on our parts, if we've been sinned against, it's very easy for us to justify our response to the sinner. I'll never trust them again. I'll never do this. I will. You, we can remember against them their sins rather than choosing not to remember against them their sins. And I want to be quick to add tonight that, that those feelings may be justified. 
Those feelings may be so justified because you've been hurt more than once. You've been hurt several times. But we have to be careful that in our responses that we do not sin by refusing to forgive. Friends, this is so important because what we're talking about is the complexities of navigating being sinned against and also forgiving those who sinned against us. So what does it mean not to remember somebody's sin against them? Number one, I refuse to bring up their offense to them. I just simply refuse to bring it up. And you know, that's the mark of someone that is really forgiven. They don't keep reminding the person that sinned against them or hurt them. They don't keep bringing it up. If you remember the story I told last week, they're not historical. They don't keep bringing up the past. They don't dig around in the boneyard. They don't dig around in the graveyard of past offenses. They deal with things as they come. But the second thing is, I refuse to bring it up to other people. I refuse to, to sully somebody's name. This week on the telephone, I was counseling with somebody over the phone because we can't meet with them because of, the, of us having been exposed to COVID in our home. So I was talking with them on the phone and I said, listen, one of the marks of a passionate follower of Christ is the name of the other person is always safe in your mouth. I know you've been hurt. I know you've been sinned against. But you can't go out and destroy their reputation. You can't go out and hurt them because they hurt you. It's so important that we remember how to forgive. And the third thing that I don't do if a, as a passionate follower of Christ when I forgive is I don't bring it up to myself. I don't keep calling it up and I refuse to brood over it myself. I just refuse to sit around mulling it, thinking about it and bringing it up to myself and reminding myself of it. Because if I do, I keep it front and center in my mind. You see, the Bible never commands us to forget the sin that's been done to us it commands us not to remember against a person who sinned against us. And I think the wisdom of that is this, and psychology teaches us this, and it's amazing to me how the Bible will always prove out good psychology. And the Bible will also expose bad psychology. You see, by choosing to try to forget it, I keep it in my mind. By choosing not to mull over it, by choosing not to bring it up to others, and by choosing not to bring it up to the person that, that has sinned against me, by beginning not to remember against them, I will find in time I forget it. Now, that doesn't mean that from time to time something painful might happen. Remember the illustration of the scars. It doesn't mean that I don't roll over onto a painful scar. Or somebody touches a painful scar. Or something brings the memory back up. But when it happens, I refuse to mull over it. I refuse to think about it. I refuse to justify it. I just simply one more time say, Father, it hurts. Just the memory. It hurts. And so one more time. I extend forgiveness and grace just like you've extended forgiveness and grace to me. I bless this person. I thank you for all that you've done in their life. I thank you for what you're doing in their lives. And, and beloved, as we do that, we will find in time that it hurts less and less and less. And we will find in time that we forget. There's a story that I read some time ago. It was about a king and his alchemist, and we've all read the fairy tales. We've all read the stories about kings and alchemists who were trying to turn metals into gold. And the king's checking account was running low. So he called all of his alchemists together, and he says, if you don't find the formula to change these metals into gold and replenish my checking account, heads are going to roll come Friday. Well, the alchemists, they worked hard. They couldn't find a, a way to change the metals into gold. And so come Friday, heads were rolling. And when they came to the last alchemist, he looked at the king and he says, Oh, king, I have solved the problem. I know how to turn the metal into gold. And the king looked at him with a little bit of suspicion in his mind. He says, Are you sure? He said, Yes, king, it will work. And so the king says, what do I need to do? He says, well, you need an eye of newt. You need butterfly wings. You need the feather of this exotic bird. You need a lizard's tail. And you know how those stories go. He went through this long list of concoctions that the king had to get. And the king shook his finger at him and says, if this doesn't work, your head's going to roll. And the alchemist went to leave the room. And he says, the king said to him, he says, don't you leave town. And the alchemist turned around and said, 
Oh, king, I forgot one important thing. I am so sorry for forgetting. But while you're doing this, do not think about an elephant. Well, <clears throat> the moral of the story was the old alchemist lived out his days normally because in choosing to try to forget an elephant, the king always remembered an elephant. In choosing to try to forget the offense against us, we will always remember the offense. But if we choose not to remember against, not to hold a grudge, not to bear a grudge, that eventually the pain diminishes and the memory diminishes and we can forget because we're not holding the sins of someone against them. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 9, it is foolish to harbor a grudge. It is foolish to hold on. You see, holding on to a grudge or holding on to a sin, it's like holding it close to your heart. You're not going to let it go. But forgiveness is just letting it go. It's dropping it. And I'm not going to drop this iPad, but it, <clears throat> it's just dropping it and letting it go. Let me tell you a story of two of my friends. <clears throat> Pardon me. I have two wonderful friends, and one of my friends sinned against the other friend. It was painful. It was hurtful. It was harmful. And I had lunch with both of them at different times and different occasions. First one I had lunch with, I invited him out to lunch. We sat down. We had lunch together, and I brought up the, the fact that he had been sinned against, and I brought up the fact, had he forgiven, because I knew he was getting more bitter as he got older. I knew he was getting angry as he got older. In some ways, he was, <clears throat> he was almost impossible to live with. And this man that had been kind and encouraging and gentle, because of the lack of forgiveness in his heart, this man who had been a passionate follower of Christ had become just the opposite of what I knew him to be. And when I brought it up, he got so angry, he slammed his big fist down on the table. And he says, I can never forgive that. And I sat there with a pain in my heart. I understood his pain. He had been sinned against grievously. Well, sometimes later, Becky and I were in another city, and I was at a conference that I was to, uh, there for. And, and we invited our friend that had actually sinned against the other person. We invited him and his wife out to lunch. And while we sat there and had lunch together, my friend brought it up. I would have never brought it up to him, but he brought it up. And as we talked, suddenly my friend began to weep. And he just said, I don't understand why he won't forgive me. He said, I've done everything possible to regain his trust, to earn his trust. And he'd made restitution and everything. And he said, he just won't forgive me. And suddenly he began holding his hands and his face in his hands. And his wife put his hand up, her hand upon his shoulder. I had my hand upon his shoulder. Suddenly his face dropped down to the table in this very nice restaurant. And he was heaving with great sobs. You see, what Christopher was illustrating in the play, The Black Angel, is so true. All of us have a need to be forgiven. Engel says, I will go if you forgive me. But some of us are like Moreau. We just simply say, we will, we will save your life, but we will never forgive you. And both of those are the wrong responses. Not only do I have a need to be forgiven, I have a real life giving need to forgive. You have a real life need to forgive those who've sinned against you. It affects the quality of your life. It affects your health. But most of all, it affects your relationship with God. For if you forgive those who have sinned against you, your Father will forgive you as well. So what do I do? There's only one answer because I can't change myself. I can't change the color of my skin. I can't change my character, my nature. I must allow the Holy Spirit to change me. I must allow God to change me. Look with me, if you would, at this next passage of Scripture from the book of Ephesians. Since you have heard about Jesus, and don't you love the Lord? Don't you love Jesus? Aren't you glad that somebody told you about Jesus? I hope in the next week, this coming week, you're going to share Jesus with somebody. I just love this phrase. Since you have learned and heard about the Lord, I promise you that's not a part of the message. I just felt like I needed to share that. There's somebody you know that needs to know about Jesus. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, 
Throw off your old sinful nature, your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception, and instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature. Come on, victory. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. What is righteousness? Righteousness is right living with God and right living with others. It's love, it's joy, it's peace, it's patience, it's kindness, it's long-suffering, it's tenderheartedness. I mean, righteousness is a beautiful thing. It's not self-righteousness where we boast about how good we are. It's just right living with, before the Lord with other people and holy. This is what God says. So there's a part of my life, I've got to put off the old nature, the old nature of bearing a grudge, the old nature of holding somebody's sin against them, the old nature of remembering their sins against them by constantly bringing it up to them, the old nature of bringing it up to other people and trying to ruin their reputation, and the old nature of bringing it up to myself and mulling over, oh, they hurt me, they wounded me, they've destroyed my life, I will never be the same, my kids will never be the same. We brood over it, we mull over it, we think of ways to get even with them, we, we dream of ways we want them to hurt. That's the old nature. That's what sinful people do. It's not what Christians do. It's not what passionate followers of Christ do. Instead, we allow the Holy Spirit by submitting to him, by trusting his word, by trusting God's word, we choose to gamble on grace. We choose to gamble on grace. We choose to gamble on the word of God that if I will live the way God called me to live, he will empower me. He will give me strength. He will help me to live the way he's called me to live, to live like Jesus. And so, I let the Spirit renew my thoughts, my words, my attitudes by studying His Word, reading His Word, meditating on His Word, and then I put on the new nature created to be like God. Now think about that. Created to be like God. You're not an animal. You're not a cosmic accident. You were divinely created to be like God. And what's God like? Well, he's like Jesus. And when you see Jesus forgiving the woman at the well, when you see Jesus forgiving Peter, who when Peter said, depart from me, I'm a sinful man, when you see Jesus having mercy of the thief on the cross, I want to be like that. I, I, I mean, I love old John Wayne movies, but I want to be more like Jesus, not like John Wayne. I, I love Indiana Jones movies, but I want to be more like Jesus, not like Indiana Jones. You see, the thing is, the new nature that God has for us when he forgave our sins is to be like him so that we become forgivers. Forgiving is a sign that I've been forgiven. Holding a grudge is a sign that I haven't been forgiven. There's a problem, though, and I want to deal with it right now because it's a real, real issue. Look with me at this verse from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Don't let sin, excuse me, don't sin by letting anger control you. You see, there are things that should make us angry. And I don't want to get into a list of enumerating those kinds of things. There are things that should make us angry. Let me go back to my two friends. The sin that one of my friends did to the other person, it made me angry. It should make anybody else angry. But you don't let anger control you. You let your anger lead you to do the right thing, the kind thing, the loving thing, the restorative thing. And I've illustrated this many, many times here at Woodland. And I'll just illustrate it one more time. I know you've heard this, but maybe you've never heard it before, especially if you're part of our online campus. And that is, when somebody sins, we don't go to them and go, they're there, that's okay. We go to them and we say, that's not okay, but we still love you. We forgive you and we want to restore you. We're going to start where we're at right now and we're going to move towards the future because God has something better for your life and God has something better for us as a community. And so we begin to move forward, letting our anger be directed at the sin, not at the person. The book of Hebrews tells us to beware of anger because anger can lead to bitterness. And in the case of my one friend, 
sin. He's living a bitter life when he used to be the sweetest man, the kindest man, the gentle man, an encouraging man, a man who loved children and encouraged them to grow, but a man that now has just separated himself. That's the reason the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 31, get rid of all bitterness. I cannot stress this enough. Misplaced anger will lead to bitterness. Mismanaged anger will lead to bitterness. But anger that is managed and placed the way God placed it, it will lead us to forgiveness and restoration. And you say, how do we do that? We do that by repaying evil with good. We do that by repaying evil with good. Someone once said that to repay good with evil is demonic. To repay good with good is human. But to repay evil with good, now that's divine. Wow, what a powerful statement. And C.S. Lewis's famous book, if you've never read it, The Screwtape Letters, Screw, uncle, the, the uncle in the, uh, in the book, he says to his young uh, mentee, he says to him, look for those opportunities when someone is hurt a Christian. Look for those opportunities when someone has sinned against a Christian because then it's easy to take advantage of them in their anger to justify their sinful responses and then we can separate them from the enemy and the enemy being God, of course. You see, it's important to get rid of bitterness and I dare say there's some of you sitting here in this room there are some of you sitting at home that are part of our online campus or you're in another state or another city, perhaps even in another country because we've heard from people in other nations. Perhaps you're sitting there and you're still bitter about what your dad or your mom did to you. You're bitter about your first or second husband or wife, and what they've done to you. You're bitter about how your children, and, and somehow or another, the sweetness and the joy of the Lord that once marked your life is no longer a part of your life. You work hard for Christ. You do all the right things, but you're really trying to earn God's forgiveness by being a good person. Again, I go back to the illustration I used last week by Becky Pepper. We can never be good enough to earn the grace of God. We have to become people who trust solely in the grace of God and forgive as we've been forgiven. The best illustration I know of this from the Bible is the story of Joseph. Wow, what a powerful story. And I, you know, I'm not going to assume that you all know the story, but it, towards the end of the book of Genesis, there's a story of a young man that was his father's favorite son. There were 12 sons, and Joseph was his favorite. As a matter of fact, Joseph was born, and his father made him this really snazzy coat when he became a young man, a teenager. Gave him this snazzy coat. He'd never given anything like this to his other boys. And, and Joseph was kind of a spoiled kid because his daddy kind of pampered him. And Joseph was this spoiled kid, and he would rat out his brothers when they weren't doing the things they should do. And one time he had this dream, and in this dream, he saw all of the sheaves bowing down to him, which represented his brothers and even his mother and father. His brothers became so jealous of him. One day his father sent him out to check up on his brothers, and when he got there, his brothers allowed their jealousy, they allowed their grievances against Joseph to get, get such a hold in their life that they threw Joseph into a pit, they sold him into slavery, they took his snazzy coat, they ripped it into pieces, they dipped it in blood, and they said to their father, you know, it must have been a wild animal that took your son. We're so sorry. And all along, they had sold him for money and they divvied the money up between themselves. Joseph went on to the most advanced civilization that there was. He was sold as a slave in Egypt. At that time, the most advanced, prosperous civilization that they were. And there he was sold as a slave. And he did such a good job that his master trusted him with everything. And yet, he was betrayed by his master's wife when she lied about him. He was thrown into prison. And there in prison, he did such a good job as a prisoner that the prison keeper put Joseph in charge of everything, but he was betrayed by a friend that he helped out and gave an interpretation of his dream to. And then one day, the friend that betrayed him by not speaking up for him, the king had a dream that troubled him. 
And the, and the friend that had betrayed him said, King, there was somebody who interpreted my dream for me. Maybe he can help you. And they bought Joseph out of the dungeon. They bought him before the king. He interpreted the dream. And suddenly Joseph has risen to where he's second only in the entire empire. He's second only to the Pharaoh. Imagine that. Everybody has to bow before him when he's, riding, when he's riding down the street in his chariot. He's clothed in these garments that were so much better than what his father gave him. He's clothed with a chain of gold. He's, he's given all the power and the influence and the wealth of any, that anyone could have imagined. And then in the course of events in the story in the Bible, Joseph's brothers end up before him as they come to Egypt looking for food. Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. Joseph's brothers had sent him far away. And then Joseph says to his brothers, he says, come close to me. Joseph's brothers had sold him for money and divided it up among themselves. Joseph gave money to each of his brothers. Joseph's brothers had ripped his garment up and dipped it in blood and showed it to their father. And Joseph gave them new clothes to put upon to replace the rags that they were wearing. Joseph's brothers had sent him away as a slave with nothing. And Joseph gives them provisions to take back. You see, Joseph could have remembered their sin against them, but he chose not to. It's not that Joseph forgot. It's not that Joseph forgot their betrayal. It's not that Joseph forgot Potiphar's wife's betrayal. It's not that he forgot his friend's betrayal in prison. It's just that he chose not to remember their sins against them. You say, Pastor, how did he do that? He gambled on the grace of God. And that's what I'm asking you to do this morning. Gamble on God's grace. Trust God. God is going to take care of you. God will provide for you. As you forgive, you will be forgiven. He will pour into your life, pressed down, shaken together, and running over without measure. The Bible says this, finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tenderhearted. Keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to, and he will grant you his blessing. It's what Joseph did. He didn't remember the sins of his brothers against them. He didn't pay them back according to what they had done. He blessed his brothers. And later on in the story, when Joseph finally reveals himself to his brothers, he reveals such maturity and such wisdom for he said, the Lord used the evil that you intended against me to bring good to you and to others. You see, what they meant for evil, God meant for good. I am convinced that my bitter friend could find great good in forgiving. I am convinced that if Moreau had forgiven Ingalls, Moreau would have found great good rather than the regret he lived with for the rest of his life, according to the play, when the general and his wife died. And I am convinced that like General Ingalls, there are some of us here today that we need someone else, not just God, but someone else to forgive us for the sins that we've sinned against them. We trust God to forgive us of our sins. All of us need the forgiveness of God because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But there are some of us today, we need to forgive those who sinned against us. And God says he will grant us his blessing. Let me just show you eight simple virtues, and then we're going to pray. This just comes right out of this passage of Scripture that I just let, read to you. You see, God calls us to be in harmony. God calls us to live in harmony. God calls us to be sympathetic to one another and to live in sympathy. God calls us to live in love. God calls us to a tender-hearted expression. God calls us to humility. God tells us not to repay evil with evil and not to retaliate with insults. And then God calls us to speak a blessing over those who have hurt us and sinned against us. And God tells us if we will do these things, he will bless us. You see, Ingalls, he didn't confess his sin. He explained his sin. He justified his sins. Moreau, well, Moreau, he would have got him out of there, 
but he would never forgive him. You see, confession and forgiving are so different than what people imagine. Forgiving is more than just talking about my sin. Forgiving is more than explaining my sin. Forgiving is more than just justifying why I've sinned. Confession is when I admit that I have sinned against you and I have hurt you. And genuine confession, then suddenly I hurt because I hurt you. I share your pain. I may not feel it the same way you feel it, but I am wounded that I hurt you. And I think that's what happens in the life of every believer At some point, we realize that we've sinned against God. It's it's what Peter said to the Lord, depart from me, Master, for I am a sinner. We're pained that we've sinned against God. And when we confess, we're pained that we've sinned against our brothers and sisters. And forgiveness is just simply letting the grudge go. It's not minimizing. It's not justifying. It's not expecting a painless future, but forgiveness, well, that's a miracle of grace that God works in the heart of every Christian who chooses to forgive what they cannot forget. Would you stand with me this morning, and I want to pray for you today. But before I pray, maybe you've never given your heart to Jesus. Maybe you've never confessed your sins to Christ. Don't try to justify them. Don't try to explain them, but you've just never said, Lord, I'm sorry. And maybe right now you're just pained inside that I brought it up a few moments ago that you carry in your pockets the nails of his crucifixion, as Martin Luther said. Why don't you just say to the Lord, Father, have mercy on me and forgive me of my sins. And he'll do that. And maybe you're here this morning and you know that you need to forgive someone who sinned against you. And so I'm asking you right now, would you release your grudge against them? As much as you know how, would you at this very moment, would you forgive them? Would you not bring up their offense? Would you not mull it over in your mind? And would you not tell other people about what they've done? Start at this point today and the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you. Let me pray with you right now. Heavenly Father, first of all, for those who have never committed their life to you, I pray for them in the name of Jesus. That, Lord, they will acknowledge their sin to you, confess their sin, and ask you to forgive them and have mercy upon them. And I pray, Lord, that you will give them the assurance and the witness in their spirit right now that as they confess their sins to you, that they are forgiven. Why don't you pray something like this with me right now? Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son to die for my sins. I admit I have sinned against you and you alone. And I ask you to have mercy upon me and to forgive me and be the Lord or the Master, the ruler of my life in Jesus' name. And if you're one of those that you've sinned against somebody, why don't you do this right now? Say, Father, Forgive me for in sinning against my brother or my sister in Christ or my neighbor, whoever it is, I have sinned against you. And I ask you to help me to go to them and ask their forgiveness. Help me not to explain or justify why I did what I did. And Lord, let me feel inside the pain of their hurt that I brought into their life. And if you're the one that you need to forgive somebody, I hurt for you. I truly do. Don't try to forget it. Just don't remember their sins against them. You join in prayer with me right now as well. Say, Heavenly Father, I understand now that forgiveness is a miracle of grace. I understand now that I must put off that old nature and I must put on the new nature And that you will renew my thoughts and my attitudes as I gamble upon your grace and your word. I trust you to help me become a bold expresser of the love of God and to live in forgiveness. For it's in Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. 
Well, God bless you so much. I'm so glad you're here. You can be seated right now. In just a moment, Pastor Rick is going to come and dismiss you today. But please remember to give. You can give again by texting 77977, keyword Woodland Church, or you can go online and give at woodland.church, or you can give on your way out of the building this morning.